Welcome to the Psychology of Human Behavior. I hope you enjoy this course. I'm David Martin, and uh, I am currently a professor of psychology at North Carolina State University. And I've been uh, teaching some form of survey of psychology for some 36 years. Uh, but what we're going to do in this course is concentrate to a great extent on some modern advances in psychology at the same time putting psychology within a, in a historical context. So I hope you enjoy it. I find psychology to be the most interesting thing that there is. Perhaps I'm biased because I chose to be a psychologist. But I think uh, you'll find it interesting too. After all, if you go to a party and you see what people are talking about, they're talking about other people and other people's behavior. Why did she leave him? Why don't they bring up their kids in a better way? They're talking about human behavior. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in this course. And I think you'll find it interesting. I certainly do. What we're going to do today is, first of all, talk about what psychologists do and make a distinction between psychologists and psychiatrists. And then we're going to talk about some of the precursors of psychology, particularly coming out of philosophy, but to some extent out of biology and out of physiology as well. Uh, then we're going to talk some about the history of psychology. It's a fairly short history over the last hundred years or so. And then we're going to talk some about some of the major theoretical trends in psychology, both in experimental psychology and in clinical psychology. And finally, we're going to do a quick look at the rest of the course and what we're going to do in those various lectures in the course, talk a little bit about what topics are included and why they're in the order that they are in this course. So that's our agenda for today. What I do when I start my survey of psychology course is often ask students to picture a psychologist. Come up with a real image in your mind about a psychologist and what that psychologist might be doing. And then I go around and, and pick on people and have them describe this person. And what they typically come up with, at least on the first pass, is that they describe it's usually a man, and it's a man usually with a beard, often with a German accent, sitting in a chair taking notes, uh, talking to a person lying on a couch who's rambling on about their life and their childhood. And that's a good picture, and it's a bad picture. It's a good picture in that it does, in fact, represent about two-thirds of the people who do psychology. That is the general area of clinical psychology, also including such things as counseling psychology, school psychology, to come up with that two-thirds figure. So it's a good, f good picture in that respect. However, it's also a bad picture in some respects, because indeed what they're probably describing is more like a psychiatrist than a psychologist to begin with. And it's kind of an old-fashioned setting, but it's one, in fact, they're probably describing Sigmund Freud, who we're going to talk about quite a bit in this course and in some future lectures. Um, so it's, it's kind of a bad picture that way. But at least it gives you the idea of what many psychologists do. Many psychologists are trying to help people solve their problems. These are people who are having problems all the way from being fairly severely uh, mentally ill to people who are maybe just having some problems in their life and looking for a more enriched life. So those are clinical psychologists that do that. But what is the distinction between a clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist? The first distinction comes in terms of training. Uh, psychiatrists tend to be medical doctors. They are trained as medical doctors. They go to school as a pre-med uh, major, as an undergraduate. They go on to school, get a medical degree, dissect uh, uh, animals and that sort of thing, learn anatomy, and become a medical doctor. They then go on for a couple of more years of intensive psychotherapy and in fact become psych are psychoanalyzed themselves before they become psychiatrists. They then can prescribe medicine for you. They have drug prescription privileges. They can give you a physical examination because they're a medical doctor. A clinical psychologist on the other hand has training usually as an undergraduate major in psychology, goes on to graduate school, gets a doctoral degree usually a PhD degree, which signifies a research degree. So this person can do research if necessary. 
Uh, in some cases, they nowadays get a PsyD degree, which is a doctor of psychology, which has a little less emphasis on research. But they still have some training in research. And so this person cannot give you a physical exam, cannot prescribe drugs, although there's a, a current uh, thing that's just starting to happen with prescription privileges for clinical psychologists, uh, although it's still in its infancy. So that's one of the major uh, distinctions to make in the clinical side is between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. If I press them further and say, well, give me another picture, many of them will come up with a picture of a fellow in a white lab coat, a bald-headed fellow with glasses with a rat under each arm going down to the laboratory to run the rat in a maze. That again is a good picture and a bad picture. It's a good picture in that it does describe the folks who work in experimental psychology, which is the other third of the folks in psychology. It's a bad picture in that hardly any of these experimental psychologists today work on animals other than humans. Most of them work with humans. And they're interested in people who are normal for the most part. So they're just interested in how people perceive things, how people remember things, how people learn things, what motivates people, and all these standard areas of psychology, many of which we're going to talk about in this course. So that's the experimental psychologist. They may work in settings such as a laboratory in a government uh, operation or perhaps a laboratory in a university. And today, more and more often, they're also working in industrial organizational jobs in industry or in ergonomics, designing systems, that sort of thing. All right. Now, what I would like to do is move on and talk a little bit about the precursors of uh, psychology. And most of these grew out of philosophy and, to some extent, biology. And let's go way back to the middle of the 1600s when René Descartes was speculating about the nature of the mind. And he was really the first one, at least he's given the credit, for being the one who made a distinction between the mind and the body. The mind being uh, the idea of being innate and also being part of the self and that that's distinct from the body. So it's sort of the ghost within the machine notion that René Descartes came up with. About 50 years later, John Locke came along and asserted that that's not true at all, that there's no innate mind. He introduced the concept of tabula rasa, which means blank slate. And so his notion was that everything is blank and the slate is to be written on by our experiences through our sensory mechanisms we bring in experiences and write on this blank slate. And as we'll see, much of psychology and the history of psychology is based upon this blank slate notion. And that's why behaviorism, that we'll talk about in a minute, became so prominent because it was all having to do with learning what was written on this blank slate. David Hume came along about 1740, and he was a British associationist. And he claimed that the mind is no more than a collection of sensory impressions that are linked together by associations. And so the association of these things is what's important. And this, again, is sort of a precursor of behaviorism as well. These associations are what happens when we do learning. In the 1830s, Ernst Heinrich Weber was one of the first empiricists. While he was not technically a psychologist, he was interested in studying uh, mental and psychological operations in a quantitative way, especially on the sensory side of things, what our subjective experience is when we're presented with certain sensory stimuli. And he wanted to quantify this. Uh, Charles Darwin came along in around 1870 and proposed the theory of evolution, and we're going to talk a great deal about that in this course. And the theory of evolution then put the human back in the animal kingdom again and said that indeed the human had certain kinds of built-in instincts and we will deal with that in this course as well. All right, so those are kind of the precursors of psychology. This is all before psychology was identified as a separate field. And then in the late 1800s, uh, the specific date 1879 is usually attributed to Wilhelm Wundt who established the first psychological laboratory in Leipzig, Germany. And it was at this point that psychologists started to become empiricists and actually collect data and form a science. 
In the late 1800s, William James, uh, while not an empiricist himself, he didn't collect data, but he read extensively about other people who did. And what William James did, he was a great writer and wrote a lot about psychology and really introduced it to America. In the, around the turn of the century, around uh, uh, 1900, Sigmund Freud came along and we'll talk extensively, extensively about him. He was in Vienna, Austria, and most people associate him with clinical psychology, but he also introduced psychoanalytic theory, which is one of the major theories that is often cited in psychology, and introduced the unconscious mind as an important concept. Then around uh, 1910, Ivan Pavlov, who was a physiologist, discovered classical conditioning. And this was sort of the beginning of the behaviorist era. And we will talk about classical conditioning and have a whole lecture on classical conditioning later on in this course. Around 1913, John Watson, who was an American, uh, started the behaviorist movement and gave it its name. And he uh, claimed that uh, there are behaviors that should be studied, that we shouldn't study the conscious mind, that all we can really study is behavior. Uh, B.F. Skinner, throughout the middle of the 1900s, uh, also talked about uh, the behaviorist tradition and introduced operant conditioning to most folks, which was a different form of learning. And again, we're going to talk about operant conditioning uh, in this course. Around the 1960s, Ulrich Neisser came along and introduced cognitive psychology. It's a different way of thinking about things. He said it that you can measure things besides behavior. That in fact it is okay to look at the mind again and that using fairly sophisticated techniques we can understand what's going on in the mind. And so they were measuring certain kinds of things like reaction times, how long mental processes took, and inferring what the mind must be like if you get these kinds of measures. So this was the cognitive revolution. And it's a revolution which is still underway today. It's still the primary paradigm in psychology. However, in the, the, uh, around 1990s, a, another paradigm has just started to be important in psychology, and it's based upon the mid-1970s work of E.O. Wilson, who uh, published a book called uh, Social Biology uh, in the... Uh, the mid-1970s. Uh, and this introduced people again to evolution and perhaps indicated that evolution might be another way of looking at human behavior. And it's had some very recent impact in psychology. All right, so that's kind of a quick history of the precursors of psychology and then some of the major players in psychology over the last hundred years. Now, there have been several theoretical trends in psychology. I've already alluded to some of these as I was talking to the, about the people. And some of these trends are in experimental psychology, and some of these trends are in clinical psychology. In experimental psychology, around the turn of the century, shortly after the original laboratory was established for experimental psychology, the major way that people collected data was through what was called introspection. People sat around, these were highly trained people, I don't mean to make too much light of it, but they were highly trained to be able to supposedly look into their own minds and figure out what the contents of the minds were. So they were trained so that if a stimulus was presented to them, they would think about how they were processing that stimulus, how they processed the color, how they processed the form, and so forth. So they just thought about what was going on in their minds and that was an approach to trying to discover what was going on in the human mind. The introspectionists uh, uh, lasted a few decades, but uh, they were fairly quickly knocked out by the behaviorists. The behaviorists came along, people like I mentioned, like Pavlov and like Watson and later by, like Skinner, who came along and said that uh, there is no way to know our own minds. How can we be both the thing doing the measuring and the thing being measured at the same time? That that's an impossibility, they said. There's no way that we can do that. And so they said, instead of doing that, we're going to measure the behavior. And that's the only real subject matter for psychology. 
is to measure the behavior. Let's ignore what's going on in the mind since we don't have access directly to what's going on in the mind. And so they started to measure behavior. And not only human behavior, in fact, not very often human behavior, because they said that human behavior could be biased by, in fact, our conscious thinking. So we can change our behavior. So let's go study behavior of more basic organisms, like animals, like rats, like pigeons, and look at the behavior of these animals, which is simpler in, na in nature and cannot sort of be o overridden by conscious thought. So this was sort of the heyday of the behaviorists, uh, and indeed in that era, perhaps the, the fellow with the rat under each arm going to the laboratory would have been an appropriate picture, because that's much of went on, what went on during the behaviorist period is people uh, running animals and just measuring their behavior, looking at the behavior as, as it was influenced by things like whether or not that behavior was reinforced. And so they held sway for 40 to 60 years in psychology until the cognitive psychologists came along. I mentioned Nicer earlier in, in the mid-1960s. And some things were happening that influenced psychology. Information processing and information theory came along. Computers came along. And people said, well, we know something about computers. Let's use the computer as a metaphor for what the human mind is like. And so we can figure out what goes on in a computer, kind of the way the, be the computer behaves by how long it takes the computer to do something, by changing the input and looking at the output and inferring what's going on, we can do the same sort of thing with the human mind. So it became legal again to look in the mind, but we didn't have the person who was doing the thinking looking in his or her own mind. In this case, we had other people looking at the behavior and trying to infer what was going on in the mind. And this was the cognitive revolution. And that revolution, as I mentioned earlier, is still probably the predominant way that psychologists go about, ex especially experimental psychologists, go about their business. Although there is this sort of new way of thinking from the evolutionary psychologists who claim that the mind is indeed not a blank slate. Even cognitive psychology is still looking at the mind to some extent as a blank slate. There's this big mainframe computer that, uh, in fact, is written on, and as it's written on, it, it gets its own software that's built into it, but it still starts out kind of as a blank slate. There are not sort of modules and pieces to this computer. The evolutionary psychologists say, well, maybe there are modules and pieces that come about through adaptations that were important from an evolutionary point of view. So that is a fairly recent trend in experimental psychology. The clinical psychologists, on the other hand, were going about their own kind of set of revolutions. Uh, Freud, we already mentioned, around the turn of the century, uh, he proposed that human motivations are largely un at the unconscious level. And for this reason, it was required that highly trained psychoanalysts must spend many years trying to determine what's at the unconscious level in order to de determine what the contents are, what the... Uh, the kind of conflict that's going on at the unconscious level in order to correct these human problems. Carl Rogers came along uh, shortly after this, and he was a humanistic psychologist, and he proposed that, well, you don't really have to have a doctor up here and a patient down here with a big power differential where the doctor knows how to cure the patient using a medical model. What he proposed is we have a therapist and a client and that these people are on fairly equal levels and that the client has within himself or herself uh, some of the ability to solve their own problems. Okay, and the therapist is just there to act kind of as a sounding board to help this person solve the problems. It's not directive the way psychoanalysis is where you tell the patient what to do. In this case, you allow the client to sort of seek his own way and get through the problems. Uh, behavior therapists came along slightly later after that. Along with the behaviorist revolution in experimental psychology, we had the behavior therapists who were suggesting that if you have problems, those problems may be the result of inappropriate learning. You've learned how to behave in the wrong way. 
And so if we're going to intervene and try to correct those problems, the way to do that is to try to have the person relearn those behaviors, relearn appropriate behaviors instead. And so the behaviorists, uh, the behavior therapists came along and used behavior, behaviorist techniques in order to try to help people solve problems. And that was kind of a, another revolution in clinical psychology. Finally, as might be expected, since we know the cognitive revolution occurred in experimental psychology, there was also a cognitive revolution in clinical psychology as well. And the cognitive therapists came along and they said, perhaps the problems that people are having are due to inappropriate thought. That is, they're thinking the wrong things. They're thinking negative thoughts. Why did I do that? Why can't I ever get anything straight? And these people are causing themselves problems because of the way they're thinking about things. And so our job, when we intervene and try to correct these problems, is to get people to think appropriate thoughts. And so a great deal of what they do when they go into therapeutic sessions is teach people appropriate thoughts. So that's kind of the history of, uh, of major movements in clinical psychology and experimental psychology. Now I'd like to take a few minutes and talk about where we're going to go in this course, what kind of topics we're going to cover, and why we're covering them in the order that we are. After today's lecture, the next two lectures, lectures two and three, are going to talk about uh, the methodologies that are used in psychology. We're going to talk extensively in the next lecture about experimentation and why an experimental model is particularly important in the science of psychology and in science in general. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about some other techniques that are used, like correlational observation, and some of the non-quantitative techniques, what are called qualitative methods, that are used in psychology. And we'll, uh, those are methods that are being used more and more frequently in psychology. We'll deal some with those. In lecture four, we're going to look at evolutionary theory, just the very basics of evolutionary theory. I think it's important to do this early on because what I would like for you to do is think about evolutionary theory and sort of apply it to some of the standard concepts in psychology as we talk about those. We'll come back later on and talk about evolutionary theory in a couple of lectures toward the end of the course, but I think it's important to get some of the basics fairly early. In lectures five and six, we're going to talk about psychoanalytic theory that I've already talked about slightly today. This is Freud's theory of our personality. It's one of the major theories of personality that's been important in the history of psychology. So we're going to talk about that some and some of the complexities of that theory. And I think it's important to talk about that before we talk about the mental illnesses because a lot of the mental illnesses, we're going to talk about classification systems for mental illnesses, are based upon some of the, uh, the basic notions in psychoanalytic theory. So in, then in lectures 7 through 11, we will talk about what makes abnormal behavior abnormal, why we think it's abnormal, and we'll also talk about how we classify mental illnesses and use a very standard classification system for mental illnesses. So we'll talk about the various mental illnesses and sort of what goes into those mental illnesses, what some of the symptoms are. In lectures 12 through 17, we're going to consider uh, several categories of therapies. Uh, and we talk about therapies, in this case, kind of separate from the mental illness, as you might think it would be better to talk about the mental illness and then immediately talk about the therapy, sort of like if you have appendicitis, what do you do to correct appendicitis? But in psychology, rather strangely, I think, therapy is often determined more by the training of the therapist than it is by the particular mental illness. We have therapists who are behavior therapists, and that's largely what they do, or who are psychoanalysts, and that's largely what they do. And they will bring this therapy to bear on a number of different classifications of mental illnesses. So we're going to talk about those, those uh, three categories of therapy, including physical kinds of therapies where we intervene with, with drugs or with psychosurgery or with genetic engineering. Uh, therapies that are behavior therapies that are based upon learning, and therapies that are the more traditional therapies, such as the talking therapies, like psychoanalysis and uh, cognitive therapies and some of those kinds of therapies. In lectures 18 through 22, 
uh, we're going to look at some theories of motivation and emphasize in particular the homeostatic model which is kind of a physiological theory of motivation. We'll also talk about emotion to some extent and emphasize how difficult it is even to measure emotion since it's a private event within us. And we'll also talk some about psychoactive drugs because psychoactive drugs have a major impact on emotions. In lectures 23 through 24, we'll look in detail at influence. Influence is one of the subtopics of social psychology, and influence, we don't have time to cover all of social psychology, so influence, I think, is one of the more interesting ones, and I hope you take some practical notions away from this about how to influence other people. In lectures 25 through 31, we're going to explore three of the major research areas of experimental psychology. And these are learning, memory, and perception. And we're going to emphasize some modern advances that have been made in these areas. There's a whole new notion about constructive processes and how important these are in those three areas. And so we're going to talk about uh, learning and how we go about learning, both in a historical context and in a more modern uh, context. We'll talk about memory and we'll talk about perception. And then in lectures uh, 33 through 34, we will talk about evolutionary psychology in more detail because evolutionary psychology, in my opinion, is a theory that gives us sort of an overarching approach to psychology and brings psychology back into the whole scientific realm of biology and some of the other sciences. And I think it's an important advancement that we're making. It also allows us to ask some questions that drew us into an interest in psychology in the first place. We're interested in psychology often because of being able to answer why questions. Why did she do that? Why did he do that? Uh, why did this happen or that happen in terms of human behavior? And much of psychology up to this point has been asking not why questions, but how and what questions. What did this person do? in this circumstance, not why did this person do it. And part of the reason for this is we've not had an overarching theory. And what evolutionary psychology does is give us a chance to uh, look at these behaviors and ask why questions, the most interesting questions, I think, in psychology. In lecture 36, or 35 first, we're going to consider engineering psychology, probably a topic you've never even heard of, I was actually trained as an engineering psychologist, so I want to give at least one lecture on this. And engineering psychology is also sometimes called human factors or ergonomics. And uh, it allows us to look at the human as an operator in a human machine system. And it exemplifies a whole area of applied psychology. And so I think it's important that we look at least one, one of the areas of applied psychology. Then in lecture 36, we're going to do a quick review of where we've been and what we've covered in the course. And we're also going to give a bit of a thumbnail sketch to some areas that we've not had time to cover. For example, developmental psychology, and in particular, gerontology, the study of older people. We'll look some at uh, cognitive modeling and uh, what cogn cognitive modeling can do. We'll also uh, look some at uh, neuropsychology and the workings of the brain. Uh, just very briefly in this final lecture. Um, so that's where we're going to go. Today what we've done is give you just a quick overview. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, what psychologists do and uh, the distinction between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. We've looked some about some of the precursors of psychology and how they've influenced psychology coming from uh, philosophy, things like the tabula rasa, the mind and how to study the mind, associationists. And then we looked at some of the uh, interesting folks in psychology during the history of psychology and some of the major theoretical trends in psychology as well and how these were influenced by the early uh, philosophers. And uh, finally, we looked about where we're going in this, this course and uh, that's where we are going to go and I hope you enjoy it as we do that. Thank you for your attention.